We're very pleased today to have, as uh, the person we interview, uh, Professor Andrew Eng of Stanford University, uh, who is also the chief scientist for Baidu. Uh, he's an exceptional individual. And to uh, continue the theme that we've uh, been pursuing today of exploring the, the technological uh, overlap with finance and with international economics, um, we think Andrew is an ideal person to help us. Um, he's somebody who has uh, had some training in economics, uh, but predominantly in computer science. He is one of the people who uh, developed uh, the concept of the massive online open courses, MOOCs, which you may have heard of. Uh, and he's currently uh, no longer actively involved in Coursera, uh, except as chairman of the uh, oversight board. Uh, but uh, he is continuing to have one foot in the academic world at Stanford, uh, and one foot uh, in Baidu, uh, which is establishing a big research center uh, in the Bay Area. So we're very pleased to have Professor Eng with us. Uh, and what we're going to do is have roughly 15 to 20 minutes of questions where I uh, raise issues with him, and then we'll go to the general audience. So we'll do the same thing we did during the Q&A, and we'll have microphones where you can ask questions. But um, first of all, welcome, Andrew. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, I wanted to start with just some personal things. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into computer science. Um, sure, thank you, and thank you for having me. So how did I get into computer science? I think like many um, people of my generation, I was fortunate that when I was a young child, maybe six years old or so, uh, my family had a computer. And um, I still remember the first half-decent computer program I wrote. It was a program that enabled you to play a guessing game. Computer, think of a number, it's your job to guess what it is, and it'll tell you your guess was too high or too low. And since that age, about six years old, um, I was fascinated by these machines that could do what you could tell them. Um, and then the, uh, when I was in high school, I learned about artificial neural networks, which was um, a rudimentary at the time form of machine learning, where it became not just computers doing what you told them, but computers learning to do new things by themselves. And that actually wound up being the basis of a lot of my subsequent career, uh, working in artificial intelligence and building machines to learn. And it's actually what I continue to do um, at Baidu uh, mm -hmm. today. Tell us a little bit about what you did when you were getting trained as a computer scientist, what sort of sub-area you concentrated on, and also at one point you worked on the Google Brain project. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So most of my professional background is in um, an area of artificial intelligence called machine learning. Um, and this is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly told what to do. All of you use machine learning algorithms probably at least dozens of times a day without knowing it. Uh, every time you um, open an email and your spam filter saves you from having to wait through tons of spam, that's machine learning. Every time your camera auto focuses on your friends' faces, that's machine learning. Um, every time you use a credit card, uh, and the software at the back that tries to figure out if it's you or if someone has stolen your credit card. That's machine learning. So uh, machine learning is a technology that is creating vast amounts of economic value. And I guess I'm, I'm quite proud that for the last 20 years, I played maybe some small role in um, advancing that technology and pushing it to products that I bet some of you might be using. Um, and then I think you mentioned the Google Brain project. So. Was it three years ago, uh, uh, about early 2011, um, I started and led a project in Google called the Google Brain Project, which um, I built to take the latest generations of uh, machine learning algorithms called neural networks, so called deep learning algorithms. This is software that loosely simulates the brain um, and tries to learn from huge amounts of data. And we built giant neural networks at Google. Um, and this has since enabled a lot of Google products to, to, to perform, frankly, much better. So, uh, for example, um, if any of you ever use speech recognition in the Google Chrome Android ecosystem, you know, you're using software that my team helped to write. Um, and since my starting the Google Brain team several years ago, uh, many other companies, including, you know, Facebook, Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, also Baidu, uh, where I am now, and many others, um, uh, uh, have also found uh, many, uh, many companies, I guess, are finding that these technologies are able to create uh, a lot of value using the, amount, using the data that they have. Okay, before we get farther into deep learning, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how the massive online 
um, open course movement got started and say something about your role in the cooperation between Stanford and other universities? Uh, sure. So, let's see. Um, there's been a lot of work in online education for, frankly, many, many decades. And those of us that had launched the first MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, were certainly standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I think the, the way the MOOC movement, the modern MOOC movement, took off was um, about three and a half years ago, uh, uh, two of us, uh, one of my friends, Sebastian Thun, and I, uh, both of us put a you know, few of our courses online, and our courses reached massive audiences. So for myself, um, teaching at Stanford for over a decade, I, I was teaching a class that reaches 400 students a year. It was pretty decent. And when I put my class online uh, in three years ago, in 2011, my class reached an audience of 100,000 learners. Um, and so you know, kind of did the math, right? To put that number in context, for me to reach a comparable size audience, 100,000 students, I figured out that I would otherwise have had to teach at Stanford University for you know, what, 250 years. <laughs> um, so uh, building on the success of uh, that first class, I invited one of my friends to join me on the project, and we wound up uh, taking the technology that my team had developed and turning that into a company, uh, Coursera, which today um, partners with top universities around the world uh, in order to offer free online courses. And so I think the MOOC movement is um, healthy, uh, uh, one thing that, um, uh, and, and I think we're you know, over 10 million learners from around the world, and China is uh, actually the second largest, is the, is China is actually the currently largest market uh, for Coursera outside the United States. Um, I think the MOOC movement is today helping us to deliver education at scale to really over, over 10 million learners and growing. Okay, uh, we'll come back to allowing the audience to ask you questions on all of this. But let's move on then to big data and deep learning. Uh, I think most economists and business people are comfortable with the term big data. They may not know how to uh, manipulate it, but they know how to use some of the results. But would you just uh, first sort of outline what are some of the differences between approaches which focus on just manipulating data versus deep learning? So. Um you know, for many years now, we've had this idea, I think as you're pointing out, that uh, um, with the digitization of our society, we have more and more data, and the data allows us to build new products, understand the economy better. Um, and what we saw with the earlier generations of AI algorithms, actually, let, let's take speech recognition. You know, I think that uh, it's amazing that we can now speak to our cell phones and have it recognize our, our, our speech in, 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 in limited context. But what we saw with the earlier generations of um, products like this, or web search, speech recognition, and so on, was that even as we, even as large tech companies such as Baidu and Facebook and Google and Microsoft and others, even as we acquired large amounts of data, um, there came a point where our AI software didn't keep on getting better. It was as if our AI algorithms didn't quite know what to do with all the data we were able to give it. So the performance would go up and then it would flatten out you know, as, as you give it more data. So deep learning algorithms um, are loosely inspired by uh, uh, neurons in the brain. Um, they're really nothing like neurons in the brain because we frankly don't even know what the human brain does, really. Uh, but they, are, they, they do take loose inspiration from the brain. And, they, and so we've been writing software that simulates huge numbers of neurons with uh, billions of connections between them. And what we have seen is that insofar as any of us have been able to measure in the regime of big data, as you feed these neural networks more and more data, the performance just keeps getting better and better. It, it doesn't go up and then flatten out, it just kind of just keeps getting better and better. And so in the case of uh, speech recognition, for example, um, today companies like Baidu and many others, we have tens of thousands of hours of speech data. Uh, together with you know the transcripts of what was actually said. So in order to uh, make, say, your cell phone recognize speech better, these we're, we're finding that deep learning algorithms are much better than the earlier generations of AI algorithms at uh, soaking up these tens of thousands of hours of data and learning how to recognize human speech. So for problems like that, uh, we're seeing that deep learning algorithms are creating vast amounts of economic value for the leading tech companies that, that have a lot of data. Uh, and do you see uh, the same techniques being used to address, say, economic or political um, analysis issues? You know, I think that's a fascinating question. Um, 
deep learning is a technology that um, today is still a relatively rare skill because there are only a very small number of teams uh, that have an in-depth knowledge of how to really do this. Um, I'm not aware of these techniques having been applied yet to economic and political problems, but uh, for, the, for, the, for the types of economic and political problems where you have a lot of data and when you want to use that data to make predictions, I think deep learning could be a, um, would be a very promising technology. Um, now, uh, when we, you and I spoke on the phone earlier in the week, um, you mentioned that you were willing to comment on some of the differences between the architecture of the internet in the US versus uh, China and the software that went with it. Um, are you willing to make some generalizations about that? Uh, we had a very interesting set of discussions this morning about both the um, initial public offerings and sort of the scope of uh, the technological innovation that's occurring. But if you would say something about the internet and the differences that you see in the way the two countries are building out the internet, I think that would helpful, be helpful for our audience. Sure. So let me rattle off some differences uh, uh, I see between the China and the U.S. technology ecosystems, maybe. Um, you know, if you look at Silicon Valley and you look at Beijing, uh, Silicon Valley, on average, if you take some sort of mean, uh, technology is more advanced in the U.S. than in China, if you, if you, if you take some sort of average. But uh, when I visit China, what I see is that the entire China internet ecosystem is learning and innovating incredibly quickly. Uh, engineers in China work really hard. Um, it really feels like a developing economy and there is a hunger in, in, in many individuals, engineers. Um, and uh, the degree to which people work hard and, and, and spend their weekends and evenings studying and trying to learn, read from books and read papers, mm -hmm. is, has, has been incredible. Uh, product cycles in China are very short. Um, in the US, in Silicon Valley, um, we tend to use the metric of monthly active users in order mm -hmm. to measure activity on the website. You know, mm -hmm. we say how, how many people were, were on your website last month, and we mm -hmm. can kind of track that and use that to measure our performance. Um, when I start to spend time in China, and I, and I mentioned that to a lot of the Chinese engineers, a lot of them looked at me with this quizzical expression there. Monthly active users? What are you talking about? Here, we use daily active users to track activity on the website because mm -hmm. last month is ancient history. Um, <laughs> that's becoming less true over time. China is shifting to monthly active users, but the, the, the cadence and the pace is incredibly fast, and so I see the whole China tech ecosystem learning. Mm -hmm. um, I think 10 years ago, there was a stereotype that China mainly copies from you know, other countries, and that's frankly much less, uh, that's, that's just not true today. And I see, um, and although uh, Silicon Valley, when you take some average, is ahead of probably the rest of the world, um, there are also many things invented in China that I just have not seen um, anywhere else. I think within the US, we often, uh, because we're familiar, we, we first became familiar with the U.S. version of some website. When we see similar things, we tend to sometimes uh, uh, individuals assume that it was invented first in the U.S. But I've been surprised several times to to find parallels where I was you know, where where I didn't realize that it was actually first invented in China. It's just that having lived in the U.S., I happened to see the U.S. version first. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned when we spoke by phone um, that the China system is much more oriented towards mobile devices. Um, what are, can you explain for a generalist audience, uh, what are the significant differences in software writing that are necessary for mobile devices versus uh, PCs? Oh yes, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so uh, China is very much a mobile first society. So I suspect that all of us, right, all of you in this room, uh, all of us had cut our teeth on uh, PCs and desktops, uh, on laptops and uh, desktops, and then only in the last several years are uh, moving to use more, more and more mobile devices, you know, cell phones and uh, tablets. Um, a lot of for a lot of users in China, their first computational device is a smartphone, and there are vastly more. Uh, and the smartphones has has had a democratizing effect, uh, uh, and and there are. And, and, and so this means that in the US, you know, we have a lot of people that were trained to use PCs that were slowly moving on to mobile devices. In China, when a lot of people's first device is a mobile phone, um, is a challenge and an opportunity. And so I see the China mobile ecosystem in, uh, uh, evolving incredibly quickly because there aren't these PC habits that we have to um, divest them of. One other interesting fact about China, um, when I visit China, 
um, uh, you know, cell phones are much bigger. Uh, so in the U.S., none of, mm -hmm. almost none of my friends are buying the iPhone 6 Plus rather mm -hmm. than iPhone 6 because the 6 Plus is just this giant phone. Mm -hmm. When I visit China, some of my friends think that the iPhone 6 Plus is a little bit small for them. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and you see these giant phones. And the reason is um, if your phone is your only computational device or is by far your main computational device, you actually want a giant phone so that you can do work on it. Um, maybe one last story. You know, by China, as all of you know, is, is, is like half a developing country and half a developed country, or developing economy and development. So um, Baidu, right, the largest search engine in China, mm -hmm. we get queries in China that you wouldn't imagine getting in the United States. So for example, let me grab a cell phone. Um, for example, in China, we get users uh, a lot of our, some of our users are less literate and just less sophisticated with, with computers. So we get uh, users coming to us and using voice search. So they'll, they'll actually say, you know, say like, this is what they'll say. And I'll, I'll, they usually speak Chinese, but I'm going to say it in English. Mm -hmm. So we get users coming to us saying, um, hi Baidu, how are you? Um, last weekend I ate noodles at the corner store and they were delicious. Do you think they are on sale this weekend? <laughs> you know, like that's the query. Um, and I think uh, if you want to serve um, users in a developing economy that are just less sophisticated and have not been trained to use keyword search like most of us have been in the US, uh, that's why we end up investing um, uh, in you know, speech recognition technology because if you have illiterate users that can't type, you have to let them speak to you. Uh, and also in AI software to, to try to understand these sorts of conversational queries So because really to the elderly to some of the young children this is the only way we really know how if, if they can't type for us to understand their information needs to try to um, uh, show them what they're looking for one last question and then we'll turn things over to the audience um, in this morning's discussion there was uh, a fair amount of interest in the question of whether the national security differences between china and the u.s uh, would affect the likely build out of future uh, internet um, facilities and also cooperation between the two countries. Um, given the disclosures about um, both countries' uh, surveillance of each other, um, do you think that this is affecting the way software is now being written? Uh, and is it also affecting the way hardware is being thought of uh, in China? I, are you aware of that? Is that conscious? Yeah, I have to admit, um, I live in the U.S., I've spent a lot of time in China, but I don't have in-depth knowledge about this. Um, mm -hmm. um, I do see that, I do see, I do know personally both people on uh, both sides of the ocean that are deeply concerned about security, but um, this is not my area of research right now, so I don't know that, so I unfortunately don't have that specialized knowledge on this. Andrew, thank you very much. I think you've given us an eye into the future uh, in a number of different areas. Uh, and you've supplemented also our earlier discussion. We're now going to turn to uh, looking at uh, the implications of technology on the details of finance and also on international relations. Uh, so uh, you've provided uh, a wonderful setting for that, and we all want to thank you very much.